Here's a fact if you didn't know. Pokemon eat food. All right, that's the whole video. I'll see you guys later. Bye. But wait, 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 wait. Okay, hear me out for a second here. What if you made food for your Pokemon? Yeah, yeah, there we go. That's a topic we can talk about. There's a good amount of Pokemon games that have mini games related to either cooking food or making food. Today, we're going to look through every generation of Pokemon. If that generation has a cooking related mini game, we're going to talk about it. We are also going to be talking about the food you make from that mini game and what effect that food has on the game itself. This video is also a follow up to the very mechanics video I made a while back. As you might have recalled in that video, I said I was going to make another video about Poke Blocks and other things you can make with berries. Well, I'm finally doing that today, but I figured I might as well talk about what you can do with food items in general, because why not? Because this is technically a follow up to the very mechanics video, we are also going to be talking about berry powder in this video, even though it's not really like a food item, it's more like a medicine, but you do make it in a cooking like mini game and it kind of fits with the themes here, and I don't really know where else I can talk about it, so screw it, it's in this video now. I will also be skipping any generation of Pokemon where you cannot make your own food. We are not going to be talking about Pokemon on me or Pokemon Refresh in this video. I know you can feed Pokemon food in these modes, but you're not making the food in some sort of minigame and that's what I want to talk about more. So just like in my other videos, we're going to start from the first generation that has said mechanic and then from there work our way upwards to other generations of Pokemon. So this time around, we're starting at Generation 3. Generation 3 was the first time we had any type of cooking minigame. Well, I guess it's not really cooking per se, but you're making something that you can eat afterwards, so close enough. In the Hoenn games, you can make these weird looking Pez candies called Pokeblocks. Or maybe they're more like fruit snacks because you use berries to make them. I don't know, do I really look like the kind of guy who would think about Pokemon mechanics that much? I actually don't answer that. Anyways, Pokeblocks are used to raise your Pokemon's contest stats. Pokeblocks have a ton of different factors which will determine its flavor and a bunch of other stats, but that'll come down to how well you make them in the minigame. So you're probably wondering what kind of minigame you're going to be playing to make these weird little candies. If you guessed Weird Rhythm Game, then you're correct. Well, I guess it's more of a timing based minigame than rhythm, but eh, it has the core timing mechanics of rhythm games, so... Eh, uh, close enough. So to start making Pokeblocks, you go up to one of these weird machines here. Once you select out the machine you want to use, you just toss your own berry into the machine like this, and then from there, the minigame starts. Well, unless you're my copy of Pokemon Emerald, then you just softlock on the screen really awkwardly. And that's all I get for experimenting with Glitzer Popping! <laughs> oh boy! Once everybody selects their own berry, the minigame actually starts. All you have to do is time your A-press to make that arrow that's spinning Touch the arrow that's next to your name. Every time you correctly time your A press to the middle arrow while it's spinning, the middle arrow speeds up. The faster you have the roulette moving by the end of the minigame will determine how well your Pokeblocks are, so you need to make sure that everybody is timing their A presses as accurately as possible for the best Pokeblocks as possible. It also doesn't help that if you actually miss your A press, it actually slows down the roulette. Once you've gotten used to the minigame, you're not going to really miss an A press, but the AI certainly will. <laughs> The AI for this minigame is really passable at best, and detrimental at worst. If you can do this minigame with actual people, which is way harder to do, you'll be guaranteed to get better Pokeblocks off this minigame for sure. But for the most part, you're probably just going to be sticking with the AI, and the AI is... <laughs> Bad. It doesn't help that you have no control over what berries the AI will throw into the machine. One of the bigger things in making Pokeblocks of berries is that if you choose the wrong combination of berries, their flavors will cancel each other out, or you'll hit a flavor that you're not looking for. You'll also probably get a higher feel, which you want to keep that low, because the lower the feel that your Pokeblocks are, the more Pokeblocks you can feed to a Pokemon. You can't just infinitely feed your Pokemon Pokeblocks, eventually they'll get full. So you want to keep that feel as low as possible, so you can raise as many contest stats as possible. So, because the AI is pretty bad at the minigame, you're going to have more Pokeblocks with higher feel, which in turn will make the Pokeblocks more filling, which means you'll have less opportunities to raise your contest stats. With that being said, there's only one, and I really do mean one in PC, that's good to blend berries with. After beating Pokemon Emerald, you might have the chance to see the Blend Master on TV. If you do hit this daily event and you go to Lilico City, the Blend 
Master will be there, and he'll always blend gold Pokeblocks with you, which are the best Pokeblocks you can blend. But if your battery is dry like mine, that means you can't get daily events, which means this will never, ever happen. So have fun making Pokeblocks with the really bad NPCs! There is a little bit more information I could cover about how Pokeblocks interact with Pokemon, but that's leading more towards the Pokemon contest territory than the Pokemon cookie minigame territory. So I'll leave it for a Pokemon contest video, which at this rate I probably will make one. One last thing I want to mention about Pokeblocks is that you can actually use them in the Safari Zone as well. While in battle in the Safari Zone, you can draw a Pokeblock to keep the Pokemon from fleeing. If they like it, they'll stick around. If they hate it, they'll just fucking ignore the Pokeblock. Oh my god. If they don't like the Pokeblock and ignore it, that means they can still flee the battle. You can also put your Pokeblocks in these Pokeblock feeders. Putting a Pokeblock in a Pokeblock feeder will make it so that up to five grass patches away, any Pokemon with a nature that was like that Pokeblock will appear more commonly. So if you put an Indigo Pokeblock into the Pokeblock feeder, you're more likely to find Pokemon with a modest nature, for example. After 100 steps, the Pokeblock's effect will wear off. While these are really nice effects, playing the game casually, I don't really see a point of making Pokeblocks just for the Safari Zone. For starters, you don't know if the Pokeblocks will actually be really useful for the Safari Zone, or just duds. It has the chance of finding a Pokemon with a similar nature you would want that Pokemon to be, but then you have to actually go out and find that Pokemon. Maybe within 100 steps you'll actually find that Pokemon, or maybe you'll just use the bunny hop on the acro bike and pretend that step counter doesn't exist, which is one way to ignore the step counter in the Safari Zone. Well, unless the Pokemon's in an area where you can only get there with the mock bike, and if that's the case, well, I guess you're gonna have to walk around like a normal human being for once in your goddamn life. Also, using a Pokeblock in battle isn't going to guarantee that that Pokemon won't flee. I say that, but there's actually a combination of Pokeblocks you can use to prevent the Pokemon from fleeing. This, however, is a glitch and not intentional, but hey, I guess it's worth mentioning. Honestly, if there was a Pokeblock maker within the Safari Zone's hall, like there is for the contest hall, maybe I could see Pokeblocks being way more useful for a casual player, because having to go all the way to Lily Cove just to make the correct Pokeblocks for the Safari Zone is really annoying. Especially if you're making them just with the NPCs. You you could make a huge batch of Pokeblocks of the Pokeblocks that you do need, but your Pokeblock case can only hold up to 40 Pokeblocks. Which for some people, that's enough, but for other people, you might want more space and there's nothing else you can do about it. So it's a neat concept, but I wish you could actually either hold more Pokeblocks or make Pokeblocks easier and more conveniently to actually take advantage of this feature in a casual playthrough. In Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, there is no minigame for making Pokeblocks anymore. You basically just pick up the four berries, you mix and match where you think will work, and then the machine just plops out the amount of Pokeblocks depending on how many berries you put in. It's cute how they have a reference to how you blended Pokeblocks in the original games and one of the contest halls, but yeah, not really much to talk about here. Now it's time for us to talk about the other type of cookie minigame in Generation 3. Well, it's more preparing medicine, but uh, close enough, and like I said, I don't know where else to talk about this, so we're talking about it now. Has anybody actually done this minigame before? Because unlike the Pokeblocks minigame, you actually need another player to play this minigame with, which is just insane to me. So what's so complicated about this minigame to the point where they couldn't program an NPC to help you do this minigame if you wanted to do it by yourself? You mashed A. I I'm not kidding, you literally just mashed the A button. The faster you and your friends mash the A button, depending on what berry you put in the berry crush machine, the more berry powder you'll hit at the end of the minigame. It's not very complicated, but for some reason you can play this minigame with up to five people. Why? Sorry, I can't do anything tonight. I'm playing Berry Crust with four other people. <laughs> Once you're done mashing the A bun with your friends, you can turn that berry powder into medicine. The energy powder, energy root, heal powder, and revival herb are kind of okay, but if you're doing Berry Crust for anything, it's probably for the vitamins here. This is the only renewable source of PP ups in Generation 3 and that's not bad. When I was hitting footage in this video game with one other person, which the other person being me, because let's be real here for a second, I don't believe I can convince anybody to just sit there and mash the A button with me for who knows how long just so I can get footage of this. Okay, maybe just Charm, but he was at work, so. So yeah, nobody. But when I was getting that footage, I was getting a really good amount of berry powder. I was getting around 300 berry powder per 15 seconds. 
So with the right berries, it'll only take you about two minutes to afford the PP up, which isn't bad at all. And that's every cooking related minigame in Generation 3. So now let's see what you can cook in Generation 4. It's time for Generation 4, and this time we're not making Pokeblocks. Instead, we're making Poffins. Right off the bat, one of the biggest differences between making a Poffin as opposed to a Pokeblock is that you can make a Poffin by yourself. With no NPC interference, you have a lot more control over what flavor you're going to make the Poffin. You no longer have to worry about an NPC drawing in a berry that'll either cancel out your flavor or give you the wrong flavor entirely. The only bad thing about making a Poffin by yourself is that the Poffin's quality is going to be way lower than if you made it with other people. With that out of the way, let's talk about actually making Poffins because they're made way differently than Pokeblocks were. In Generation 4, to make a Poffin, you have to go to the Poffin house and interact with one of these Poffin cooking machines, which are they a pot? Are they a stove? I don't know what they are, but you make the Poffins on top of them. Once you pick what berry you want using your Poffin, you start the minigame. The minigame is very straightforward. All you have to do is stir the pot in the direction the touchscreen is telling you to stir it in. Occasionally, it will tell you to stir it in the opposite direction that you're stirring it in currently, but that's really about it. You want to stir the pot as quickly as possible, but if you stir it too fast, the dough will overflow. But if you stir it too slowly, the Poffin will start to burn. It's a game about juggling and finding a sweet spot. You don't want to go too fast because then you'll overflow your poppin, but you don't want to go too slow either because then you'll start to get it to burn. Depending on how far you are along the minigame, the flames at the bottom of the pot will change color. The game begins with the flames being red. At this point, you can spill pretty easily, so you don't want to go super fast yet. Eventually, the flames will turn orange, which means you'll have to stir faster. But it also makes it so the pot is a little bit harder to spill now. You can still spill out in this stage, but it's a lot less likely. And once they turn blue, that means the minigame is almost over, and you can spin the pot as fast as you like because the pot will never spill from this point onward. And after a little bit more stirring, you're done. Honestly, this minigame is way more engaging than blending Pogo Blocks, and I actually found it way more fun to play too. Poppins work the same exact way Pokeblocks do. The only difference here is that instead of calling it a feel stat, it's called a smoothness stat now. I guess it's smoothness instead of feel this time around because pastries just feel smoother in your mouth and candy just feels hard in your mouth. I, I, I really got nothing here, okay? Other notable things is that you can buy Poppins in Platinum only. While not the best, these store bought ones are actually pretty alright. The mechanics for making Poppins are the exact same as Generation 8. Obviously there's no touchscreen controls this time around because it's on a console, so instead you're just rotating the control stick in whatever direction it's telling you to. Personally, I like the touchscreen controls way more than spinning the control stick, but that's just me because I think the stylus controls actually make the minigame harder and more engaging, as opposed to the control stick spinning. I just don't feel like the control stick spinning is that engaging, plus it just feels like it's way easier to maintain your circles so you're not overflowing or burning as often, which can be good for some people, but for me, I don't mind a little bit of a challenge, I guess. Generation 8 allows you to put more than one berry into the pot, so you're not penalized for making poppins by yourself, and you can make pretty good poppins by yourself without having to rely on other people. The only other thing Generation 8 adds is that now when you go to Amity Park, you can also make poppins there as well. Making poppins at Amity Square will make it so it's easier to make poppins of a higher level. And your Pokemon gets to watch you make the poppin, which is actually kind of cute. Generation 4 has one other cooking related thing I want to talk about, and that's the stuff with the Apricorn Blender. Do you remember the Pokeathlon? I don't. It was basically a place where you could go and play some touchy related minigames using your Pokemon. It was kind to like Pokemon contests, except you do athlete stuff, whatever that might be. But just like Pokemon contests, it had its own separate thing of stats for it, which you could raise by making your Pokemon drink Apricorn juice. I would not call this a mini game per se, but it is kind of related to the themes of this video, so sure, why not talk about Apricorn juice? All you do is put five Apricorns in the Splendor, and then you just walk around for 100 steps and it's done. Depending on what Apricorns you mix together, you'll get a different flavor of juice. Different flavors of juice will boost different types of Pokeathlon stats, with some juice actually lowering some stats. Some Pokemon like some flavors more than others, depending on their nature. You can taste test the juice before you give it to any kind of Pokemon, so you have an idea of what stats it's going to boost. You can also continue to add Apricorns even if the juice is halfway full, just to make a completely different flavor if you really wanted to. 
And that's really all there is to say about this. And that's all I gotta say about Generation 4, so join me for, oh my god, Generation 8? <laughs> yeah, I'm kinda surprised there wasn't another cooking-like minigame until Generation 8. With Pokemon Ami and Pokemon Refresh just give you food basically for just doing different types of minigames, and we'll talk about all that in another video, probably. God, I'm just really giving myself a backlog of video ideas at this rate, aren't I? So let's do Generation 8 before I come up with some other Pokemon idea that I'm gonna have to do in the future. I don't do anything else anymore. I really am a PokeTuber. Why did I come down this path? What happened to me? What the f Do you like curry? I've actually never had curry, so I, I don't even know what to feel about it. Kind of weird how we went from Pokeblocks and Poppins, which are like fake made up Pokemon food, to just real life curry now. That's it. It's the real deal! To start cooking curry, you have to go set up camp with your Pokemon. Once you do that, you can pick out your main ingredient, your berries, and then you can make out of one of the 151 curry recipes in the game. That's right, you heard me correctly, there's 151 curry recipes. You know, the same amount of Pokemon there is in Kanto originally. Because there's so many recipes, they actually have their own individual Pokedex just for curry. Which is kind of cute, honestly. Something unique about making curry, unlike every other cookie mini game before it, is that there's three different sections to it. You start off by mashing the A button to fan the flames, or you can use the Joy-Cons as well, but I'm not going to be using any motion controls in this, so... Sorry, I prefer using the actual Pro Controller and not whatever the fuck a Joy-Con is. When you fan the flames, it's the same kind of mentality as when you're making Poffins, where you don't want the flames to get too hot or else they'll burn the curry, but you don't want them to be too cold either. So you have to mash enough where the flames will get really big, but not too big where they're burning everything. Once the game decides that you're done fanning the flames, you go right to the stirring phase. All you do in this phase is spin the control stick in a circle. Just like Poffins, if you spin it too fast, the curry will overflow. You don't want that. But if you spin it too slow, it'll start to burn again. Well, I didn't like the stick rotation when you're making Poffins in the Generation 4 remakes, but in Generation 8, it feels like the stirring has a little bit more weight to it, and it feels like you can't just spin the exact same way the whole time like you could in Diamond and Pearl remakes. So you have to constantly adjust how you're spinning your stick, so there's a little bit more depth to it in that way. Or you could be like this random player I found online who spins the stick like a bot, and for what some reason that got me the best curry. I don't know how. Once you're done stirring the curry, you go to the final step, which is putting some love into it. All you're doing in this phase is trying to tie your A press correctly. Depending on how well timed your A press is, it'll make the curry just a little bit better. If you're playing the game in multiplayer and more than one person ties their A press correctly, you'll get this little animation to appear, which is kind of cool. After that, your curry is rated out of five ranks, the lowest being Hopping rank and the highest being Charizard rank. Depending on how well the curry is made, it'll determine how much EXP your Pokemon get, how much they'll be healed by, how much sociability you'll have. I'm not going to talk about sociability that much in this video, just know that the higher sociability you have, that just means good stuff will happen in the Pokemon camp. And it will increase the spawns of wild Pokemon around you after you're done camping. Also after you're done making curry, Pokemon will hastily give you items. Okay, so normally I would show that happening here, but the thing is, I've played this curry minigame for over five hours straight, and I'm kind of tired of it, and it never happened once, so. It's supposed to be more common if your Pokemon are very friendly to you, or if you have high sociability, but never happened to me. So, we're just gonna have to take Bulbapia's word for it for once, which I know is true, because I know this has happened to me once but goddamn, I was just unlucky for this video. Also, after making curry, occasionally wild Pokemon will join your camp and want to join your party. This chance is higher depending on your sociability stat, which you can increase by making curry. Also, when you make curry on your birthday, you get a little birthday cake candle on the curry. Kind of weird, but hey, it's kind of cute, I guess. And that's all I have to say about Generation 8's cooking minigame. This minigame is way more involved than the previous ones I've talked about so far. There's a lot of pre-prep into making curry. You really gotta think about what combination of berries you wanna use for your main ingredient. Especially if you're gonna complete that curry dex. But the minigame itself is a lot like the Poffin making minigame back in Generation 4. Not a bad system, but it's just alright. I'm also just sick of this minigame. I, I played it for so long for this video. I, I, I'm done. Join me for Generation 9 as I talk about the least glitchy part about that game. That's right, the sandwiches. Have you ever wanted to work in Subway? Well, I guess Subway wasn't this glitchy, but close enough! Generation 9 is known for 
a lot of things right now, and I guess it's just known for being a glitchy, unfitness mess, but I don't want to think about that here. We're here to talk about cookie minigames and not whether or not the game is undercooked. All right, with that out of my system, let's talk about the cookie mini game here, which is not really cooking, it's more like food prep, but say it with me, it fits the themes of this video. Anyways, to make a sandwich is pretty simple. You gotta start a picnic. From there, you can pick out one of the many sandwich recipes you can find throughout the game, or you can go into creative mode and pick whatever toppings you like on your sandwich. Recipe mode is really just there as a guideline. If there's a recipe you want to make, you know what it is off the top of your head, or you just looked it up or something. As long as you have the ingredients, you can just make it in creative mode, even if you don't have the recipe for it. The recipe mode is just there for people who are looking to make a sandwich with whatever they have on hand currently, or they just want to get a certain meal power without having to look up a guide or just trying to brute force it in general. Making the sandwich is actually pretty simple. All you have to do is pick up the ingredients and then drop them on the bread. That's it. On paper, this sounds very simple, but in execution, all of the ingredients have physics for some reason. So you have to make a literal balance of being able to place all the ingredients on your sandwich, but also not having any of them fall off. Because if you have them fall off, it'll make your final meal power worse. The top bun of the sandwich actually doesn't matter towards the minigame, weirdly enough so you can just toss that thing aside if you're really worried about your ingredients falling off. And then you put the pick in it and you're done! Unlike the previous mini games, you don't really get a benefit for doing the mini game well, you just get the exact meal power that the recipe would normally give you and that's it. There's a ton of different meal powers in the game. These range from catching Pokemon of a certain type easier, finding Pokemon of a certain type easier, getting shinies of a certain type of Pokemon easier, increases the chance of Pokemon breeding, finding bigger or smaller Pokemon, or even having a higher chance of finding Pokemon with titles on them. Other notable things about this video game is that there's an actual time limit for how long you can make the sandwich for. You get 10 minutes to make the sandwich, which is a lot of time, to the point where I question why is there a timer in the first place. Usually after a minute you have the sandwich completed, so I really don't see the point of this. There's no extra challenge here, it's just there to be there. They also for some reason give you an extra 2 minutes to put on the top one. Why? What's the point of this? And they give you another two minutes to put your sandwich pick in there for... I, I really don't understand why is there so many timers. Maybe because this is tied to multiplayer, they don't want people to take too much time and waste other people's time. If that's such a big issue, then why can't the host themselves set whether or not they want a timer or not? And have it so there's no timer on offline mode. Either way, it's a very weird design decision, and also for the hell of it, here's what a bread sandwich looks like. Like, there's literally nothing on the sandwich, and this is what it does. Speaking of multiplayer, I think it's just really funny that you can just make a sandwich with multiple people, and the sandwich itself gets bigger depending on how many people are making the sandwich with you, and everybody shares that sandwich, so they have to put their own separate ingredients on the same sandwich. It gets pretty chaotic, and honestly, it's kind of fun. Highly recommend it if you actually have three other people you can make a sandwich with, and with that, that's all I have to say about Generation 9's cooking mechanics. It's kind of funny looking back on it, because besides the Apricorn Blender, all of these are minigames you have to do with other people. With Gen 3 or Gen 4, if you don't do it with other people, you're just going to either get bad or subpar results. Or in some cases, like in Generation 3, you can't even do the minigame at all. So I'm thankful that from Gen 8 onward, you don't need other players to get good results in these minigames. You can do it all by yourself now, and adding more people just makes it so those results are easier to get, but not impossible to get by yourself. And I prefer that way more, and I'm very glad they did that change. And that's it, we're done talking about cooking food for Pokemon. Until next time, I'll see you all later. Bye! Hi, welcome to another end slate where I talk about stuff, I guess. This video took a long time to make. Well, to be fair, I had another video I was making, but I kept thinking about this video and I wanted to make this video more, so I put the other video on hiatus and I made this video instead. And I started work on this video on December 5th, and now it's January 9th, and it's finally done, and it's over with. I wanna thank a lot of people who helped me make this video. You'll see like a lot of credits for this video. I actually had to ask for footage for this video because there was no way I was gonna get the Blend Master stuff. Honestly, I didn't think to ask anybody to help me get the footage for the curry stuff because that is such a random ass chance of happening. I just didn't wanna delay this video even more. 
Just like the Xenoblade video, there was a video before that one, and I cancelled that and changed the topic, and because of that, it delayed this video even more. And then on top of that, this video was delayed for a ton of different reasons. It was the holidays, Scarlet and Violet came out, um, I'm trying to think of like what else, just general stuff, also looking for work. There's just a lot of things that came in the way of this video, and I wish I could say that after this video comes out that there will be more videos more frequently, but probably not. We'll see. I want to upload things more frequently, and I want to actually, you know, just get some kind of regular upload on here. But that doesn't seem like it's actually going to be happening soon, because I'm probably going to start working soon, finally. Oh my god. <laughs> I feel like I've been unemployed for so long, it's just so weird. But we'll see, because I really want to make this channel my priority in 2023, because I like doing this stuff, even if it takes fucking forever. I have to do so much more research on this too. I thought this video was going to be short and easy. I was so wrong. Um, even during this video, there was parts of it where I was like, oh shit, I need to talk about this and that, and oh my god, I just kept getting bigger and bigger. And even though the video was like, I think one of the more kind of, not shorter videos, it's just kind of like medium length videos. There was a lot that went into this. It doesn't look like there was a lot that went into it, but there was a lot that went into it. So thank you for watching. Um, do the usual YouTube shit, especially if you want to, you know, support the channel. I appreciate it a lot. All right, I, I genuinely hope that after this video, I see you guys at least within a month but here's hoping but probably not so until then i'll see you guys later bye